if you were asked uh, to summarize in one word who or what you thought the Bible was all about, what would you say? Surely the correct answer to that question is God. From beginning to end, the Bible is first and foremost about God. It is a word from God and is all about God. It is, as we saw the last time, it is that means of special revelation by which God has revealed himself to us. Yes, it's true to say that the Bible speaks on many other subjects and reveals many other things as well. Things about our world, ourselves, our history, our morality, our salvation, the past, the present and the future. Although it tells us about all sorts of things, we must never forget that the Bible is first and foremost a revelation from God about God. And so if we are reading our Bibles, but never learning about God, or if we are listening to sermons and never learning about God, then it may suggest that we and our preachers are missing the point of what the Bible is really all about. But what does the Bible tell us about God? Well, I want us to think this evening about three foundational truths which the Bible teaches concerning God. And the first of those is my first point this evening, and that is there is only one God. There is only one God. Now, as you read through the Bible, you very quickly realize that uh, polytheism, that is the belief in a plurality of gods and the worship of several gods, polytheism has been around for a long, long time. For example, the opening verses of Joshua chapter 24 uh, tell us that Terah, the father of Abraham, who we first read about uh, way back in Genesis chapter 11, he lived beyond the river, i.e. the river Euphrates, and worshipped other gods. Which indicates that Abraham himself was called by God out of a polytheistic background. And although we sometimes think that we are the first generation of God's people uh, to find ourselves faced with the challenge of living in a pluralistic and polytheistic society, the Bible suggests that the Lord's people have nearly always found themselves living in that sort of environment. It's nothing new. For example, in Exodus chapter 12, we read about the gods of Egypt that the Israelites were surrounded by during their time uh, down there. Later on in Old Testament history, even after Israel had settled within the promised land, we lead, read of the Baals and the Asherahs and all sorts of other gods. And it's because of the presence and the prevalence of all those gods in Old Testament times that there are numerous references to them in the Psalms and the prophets of the Old Testament era. Time and time again, as we read in Isaiah there, 44, time and time again, the prophets have to rebuke the people for turning and worshipping other gods. But although there are those references to the various gods which the people of that day worshipped, the Old Testament is very clear that there is only one true living and eternal God. The Bible begins with these words, in the beginning, God. Not gods, but God. In the beginning, there was one God. One God who was eternally pre-existent. One God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. And whereas he is the creator, and this is the huge distinction that the Old Testament prophets highlight time and time and time again. Whereas he is the creator, all those other so-called gods are created things. They're all the product of man's wicked and rebellious and idolatrous inclinations. As we discovered last time from Romans chapter 1, 
Man has rejected the unmistakable revelation that God has given of himself in creation, and he has indeed, Romans 1 verse 23, he has exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. They have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. That is why human society very quickly became polytheistic, and that is why it has been polytheistic ever since. We as a race have chosen, deliberately chosen, to worship created things the product of our own minds, the product of our own hands. We have chosen to worship created things rather than the creator. And the fact that there is a creator God is one of several reasons why it is he and he alone who ought to be worshipped as God. For example, Psalm 96 verse 4, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Why? The next verse. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And it is the Old Testament prophets like Elijah and Isaiah who highlight, sometimes with a small dose of sarcasm, the vast difference between the true God and the false man-made gods of this world. The one is eternal. The others came into existence in time. The one is living. The others are dead. The one is creator. The others are created. The one is all-powerful. The others are powerless. The one can hear his worshippers and does speak. The others are both deaf and dumb. The one is to be worshipped. The others are to be demolished and abolished from our lives. And the exclusive right of the living creator God to be worshipped is not merely something which the Old Testament prophets said in defense of their God. It is also something which the eternal God insisted on himself. For example, in giving his people his law at Mount Sinai, commandment number one was, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them from I, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And the reason God is rightfully jealous of the honor and the worship that is rightfully his is because he is the only God. For example, in his dedication of the temple, Solomon said this, 1 Kings 8, verse 60, so that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. As God himself says through the prophet Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 5, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. A little earlier, chapter 43, verse 10, we hear him saying, Before me no God was formed, nor will there ever be one after me. Isaiah 44, verse 6, that we read earlier, this is what the Lord says, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And just in case you've clocked that all my references so far are from the Old Testament, and you may think maybe that's just an Old Testament emphasis, then listen to what the New Testament writers say. Listen to the words of Paul, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God. James 2, verse 19, You believe that there is one God? James didn't then say, Well, you're not quite right. No. He says, you believe there is one God. Good. You've got it right. 
The testimony of both Old and New Testaments is that there is one God. The testimony of Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles is that there is one God. The testimony of God himself is that he is the one and only God. Moving on, secondly, the one God exists eternally as three persons. The one God exists eternally as three persons. Now, as Wynne has already highlighted tonight, you don't need to read very far in the Bible before you start to see that although there is one God, there is a plurality of persons within God himself. For example, the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Did you notice the plurals in that verse? Let us. In our image. In our likeness. Who is God speaking to? Some have tried to argue that God was speaking to the angels. But that explanation will not do because nowhere do we read of the angels being involved in creation and man was certainly not made in the image and likeness of the angels, that's for sure. So the only reasonable explanation is that God is speaking to God. Or well, not merely speaking to himself, as we sometimes do, especially as we get a little bit older. Instead, he's speaking to other persons within the Godhead. And the same could be said of Genesis 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of, like one of us, plural. Genesis 11, verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language. In Psalm 45, verse 6, we hear the psalmist say, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. The psalmist is clearly addressing God. But then he says this in verse 7, Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions. He's speaking to God, but he's also referring to someone else who is God. And bearing in mind that there is only one God, the conclusion that must be that there is a plurality of divine persons in God himself. But then what we always have to remember when looking at subjects such as this is that biblical revelation is progressive as we work our way from Genesis to Revelation and especially as you move from Old to New Testament. And so as is often the case with biblical truth, this one also becomes clearer and more obvious as you move into the New Testament, because in reading our New Testaments, we come across several references where this plurality of divine persons is clearly referred to, and we discover who these divine persons are. For example, at the very end of Matthew's Gospel, we read of Jesus uh, bringing his disciples together and telling them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please note, Jesus does not tell them to baptize in the names plural of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but in the name singular. There is one name, i.e. God's name but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Likewise, at the close of 2 Corinthians, we hear Paul say those familiar words, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, in both the Matthew and the 2 Corinthians reference, 
it is evident that all three are being referred to as distinct persons. They have been referred to as distinct persons. And it is equally clear that all three are considered to be equal. They are considered to be on a par with one another, if I can use that phrase. Because if you think of it, it would be unthinkable to speak of all three in those ways if only one of them was God. It would be heretical, if not blasphemous, to baptize in the name singular of all three, if only one or even two of them were divine persons. And therefore, the conclusion we come to from those and other references is that although there is one God, the one God exists eternally as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I emphasize the word eternally because we must not think that there is only one divine person who is constantly changing name and switching role depending on the circumstances. That is something which has been taught throughout the history of the church and it has been labelled as modalism uh, because according to that view, the one person appears in different forms or modes. But that cannot be true because it completely denies the existence of relationships within the Godhead. And it doesn't make sense of those passages where Father, Son, and Spirit are interacting with one another. For example, at the baptism of Jesus, we are told that as Jesus was coming up out of the water, heaven was opened and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. At the same time, a voice from heaven said concerning Jesus, this is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And so we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each taking a part and playing a particular role within the one event. Something that would have been impossible if it was merely one person taking on three different forms. Likewise, modalism denies the reality of prayer in the life of Jesus. If there is only one person, then it would mean that in his praying, Jesus was really only praying to himself. Such a view is ridiculous. And that is why we must insist not on one divine person taking three different forms, but we must insist on one God existing as three persons eternally. And each person being truly God. That is a truth which has been known throughout the history of the church as the doctrine of the Trinity. And you will have those people who will knock on your door and they'll say to you, but ah, where do you find the word Trinity in the Bible? And of course you don't. The word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. But as we've seen tonight, the truth that is represented by the term is clearly taught throughout the scriptures. But although it is clearly taught, can I emphasize that it will always remain something of a mystery. And in one sense, that shouldn't surprise us. Shouldn't surprise us. What makes us think that we, as mere mortals, creatures of time, will ever be able to fully understand or grasp the being of the eternal God. And so although God has revealed and explained so much of himself in the scriptures, there comes a point where we have to humbly accept what he has revealed of himself and be content with that. And what we can say from Scripture is three things. Firstly, there is one God. Secondly, God exists eternally as three persons. And thirdly, each person is truly God. That is what we do know about God from his word. And if we concentrated 
on what we do know concerning the Trinity, rather than racking our brains trying to think of illustrations for it, then can I say we might be better off concentrating on what we do know. I say that because there have been numerous attempts to try, all due respect to Jonathan Edwards, there's been numerous attempts to try and illustrate the truth of the Trinity. You will have heard of them from clover leaves to eggs to the scientific properties of water, all of which are either unhelpful or so complicated that you would need a PhD in physics to follow them. And so rather than use our brains to conjure up something ourselves, why don't we just use them instead to humbly accept and believe and understand as best as we can what God has revealed of himself? And that is, as we've seen, that there is one God who exists eternally as three persons, each person being truly God. Thirdly and finally, I want us to think about the work of the triune God in redemption. The work of the triune God in redemption. And this is where the reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 comes in. Now, as we've already discovered from the opening chapter of Genesis, the triune God was involved in the work of creation. Let us, plural, make man in our image. It was a corporate work. That is confirmed by the reference to Genesis, in Genesis 1 verse 2 to the Spirit of God over and over the waters and by the teaching of the New Testament concerning Jesus. For example, uh, John 1 verse 3, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. Father, Son and Holy Spirit at work in order to bring this universe and all that is in it into being. But what is also taught in Scripture, and perhaps taught more fully, is that the various persons of the Godhead were not only involved in the work of creation, but that each person of the Godhead has also been very much involved in our redemption as Christian people. For example, writing to those first century Christians, Peter says this at the start of his letter. Did you notice it? To God's elect. Strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. So what you have there is a clear and unmistakable statement which testifies not only to the truth of the Trinity, and not only to the deity of each person within the Trinity, because if you think about it, if any of the persons mentioned were anything less than God, then they could not play such a role in the salvation of sinners like you and me, could they? But in addition to those things, there is also a testimony to the fact that the three persons of the Trinity have fulfilled their own particular and vital role in our salvation. Firstly, says Peter, it was God the Father who chose us for salvation in a past eternity. God the Father. And he did so, says Peter, according to his foreknowledge. Now that reference to foreknowledge has sometime been sometimes been taken to mean that God saw, he looked down through the centuries, and he saw in advance who would turn to him, and on the basis of that foreknowledge, he chose them. That is our choice, and God merely rubber stamps it in advance. That is not what the Bible teaches about God's sovereign choice in election. Instead, what the Bible teaches is that God's choice of us was entirely unconditional and not due to anything good in us and certainly not our future response to him or his gospel. Left to ourselves, as we discovered this morning, we would never have responded to the gospel. Never. And the only reason we have is because God has first chosen us. And the reason that choice was according to his foreknowledge is 
is because prior to the creation of this world, God freely and sovereignly and unconditionally chose to set his electing and redeeming love upon certain people. And having set his love upon such people, he knew them lovingly and intimately as a husband and wife would. And God did so in advance of them. Prior to creation, he did so in advance of them uh, being alive. He foreknew them. Please note, God's foreknowledge in this context is his foreknowing of people, the people themselves, and not just facts about those people. And it was according to that prior and intimate and loving knowledge of those people that he chose them for salvation. That is the work of God the Father in our redemption. Secondly, it was God, the Holy Spirit, says Peter, who sanctified us. And when it uses the word sanctification here, it's not referring to that ongoing progressive work of sanctification in our lives whereby we increasingly become more like Jesus. That sometimes the Bible does speak of that as sanctification. And that also is a work of the Spirit. Uh, but that is not what has been referred to here. What has been referred to here is what was referred to at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, and that is the definitive work of sanctification in our lives, whereby the Holy Spirit intervenes in our experience, in the experience of those whom God has previously chosen, and the Holy Spirit singles them out or sets them apart for salvation. In other words, it is the Spirit who applies the sovereign choice of God and the redeeming work of the Son to our lives. It is he, to use Peter's phrase, who sets us apart. That's what sanctification means, to set apart. It is the Holy Spirit who has set us apart for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Which brings us thirdly to the work of God the Son in our salvation. Now through the old, throughout the Old Testament scriptures you often read of people and objects being sprinkled. And the sprinkling on those occasions usually symbolized the ceremonial cleansing of those items or those people. And it is in that sense that Peter is using it here, except that he's not merely speaking of a ceremonial or a symbolic cleansing. Instead, he's speaking of a real and a thorough and an actual cleansing of the sinner in the sight of God. And the way in which such cleansing has been made possible, says Peter, is through the blood, i.e. through the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Do you see how the three persons of the Trinity have been at work in your salvation if you are a Christian this evening? In a past eternity, God the Father chose you. In time, God the Son came into this world and shed his blood for you in order to cleanse you from your sin. And in your experience, God, the Holy Spirit, has singled you out and set you apart from the masses of humanity so that you may know the cleansing in the blood of Christ and be obedient to Jesus Christ. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working in perfect unity, working in perfect harmony, for your salvation and mine. And as Michael Reeves, one of the great theologians of our day, has pointed out, it is only because he is a triune God that he could ever provide such a salvation for us. Think about it. If God were a single person God, such as you have in Islam, or in Judaism, then he could never have provided a perfect substitute for us who would die for us in order to provide for our cleansing and our forgiveness. If God were a single person God, 
then we could never know him as father. Because for God to be a father, he must have a son. If God were a single person God, then we could never know him. We could never be in relationship with him for the simple reason that he would not be a relational God, but rather one who had been existing entirely on his own for all eternity. Whereas with a trinity of persons within the Godhead, we have a God who has always been in relationship from all eternity. The Father in relationship to the Son and the Spirit. The Son in relationship to the Spirit and the Father. The Spirit in relationship to both Father and Son. And it's because he is and always has been a relational God that he's able in his great grace and mercy to bring us into relationship with himself. A single person God is not relational. With a trinity of persons within the Godhead, we have a God who is and has been from all eternity, Father. He is a Father to the Son. And the great truth of the Christian gospel is that by sending his Son to be our Saviour, this eternal Father has redeemed hopeless and helpless sinners like us from our sin, and through the sanctifying and regenerating work of his Spirit, has adopted us into his family and made us his sons. So much so that we're able to call him our Father. That is the work of the triune God in our redemption. And far from being nothing more than boring academic theological jargon, I trust we've seen tonight that God's three-in-oneness is absolutely central to the Christian gospel and absolutely crucial for our salvation. Three things we've considered this evening concerning the doctrine of the Trinity. There is only one God. The one God exists eternally as three persons, the work of the triune God in redemption. We are going to sing in closing a hymn that expresses uh, the three in oneness of God. Uh, hymn number 71, if you're using a hymn book, we give immortal praise uh, to God the Father's love for all our comforts here and better hopes above. To God the Son belongs, verse 2, immortal glory to who bought us with his blood from everlasting woe. Verse 3, to God the Spirit's name, immortal worship give whose new creating power makes the dead sinner live. Verse 4, almighty God to thee be endless honours done the undivided three, and the mysterious one, where reason fails. Please note, there will come a point where reason fails. He is God, where reason fails with all her powers. There faith prevails, and love adores. Stand and to see.
eternal and triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you tonight and we want to acknowledge you as the great, the eternal, the sovereign God. We want to acknowledge you to be the only God. And Father, we bow tonight and thank you that in your great goodness you have chosen us in a past eternity. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world, living that life that we ought to have lived but never could, and going to the cross and dying that death we ought to have died. And Spirit of God, we want to thank you tonight for that sanctifying, regenerating work within our lives. Thank you for bringing us to faith in Jesus Christ. And so we bow before you, eternal and triune God. And as we have just sung, we do pray that where reason fails. And our God, we want to confess that our minds are so small and so puny. We want to acknowledge tonight, our God, that what we do know is only a fraction of what there is to know. But where reason fails, we do pray that their faith might prevail and love might adore. Help us, our God, to give you the worship that you alone are due. Keep us, our God, in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives from giving that place of supreme honour to worthless, lifeless, useless things. Help us, our God, to bow before you, the only God, for we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen.